Awesome. Great. Hello. Thanks, Brandon. And hello, everyone. And thank you so much for joining. Um, like Brandon said, my name is Alexis, and I have the esteemed pleasure of introducing our first round of symposium technical talks with this morning's session focused on biotechnology and advanced materials. We have six presentations for you in this session. Any questions you have for our presenters, please pop those questions into the chat. And if time permits at the end of each presentation, we will pose those questions to our presenters. Any questions that we don't um, have the time to address uh, can be moved over to the Whova app on the community board. So let's go ahead and get started with our very first presenter, Ms. Priscilla Lee. Priscilla Lee is with the US Army DEVCOM Chemical Biological Center with her project title, Utilizing Microphysiological Systems for Predictive Toxicology. So Priscilla, go ahead and share your screen. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, let me see. All right. Uh, are we all good? Looks great, Priscilla. Awesome, sounds good. Well, hello everyone, uh, good morning. I hope everyone is doing well today. And um, I am excited to meet you all virtually, hopefully throughout the next couple of days. Um, my name is Priscilla Lee, and I'm currently in phase two of the SMART Scholarship Program. And I'm just excited to talk to you a little bit more about my sponsored facility, as well as the work I have done since I joined. Um, my talk is titled, Utilizing Microphysiological Systems for Predictive Toxicology Efforts, which I'm excited to share more about. And I completed my Bachelor's of Science in Bioengineering at the University of Maryland uh, College Park last May. And I have been working as a biologist at the US Army DEVCOM Chemical Biological Center since November of last year. Uh, fun fact, we're actually located about an hour and a half north of the original conference site in Tyson, so an Aberdeen Proving Ground. So we're pretty local um, to the original site that we were supposed to meet at. Um, next slide. So a little bit more about my sponsoring facility, which I mentioned earlier, I am currently under the Research and Technology Directorate. Um, so that is uh, under the Threat Agent Science Division and more specifically within the Molecular Toxicology Branch. So this team is composed of a lot of scientists, um, including biologists, chemists, toxicologists, really looking at specific biological aspects of potential threatful agents. Um, the mission of my center as a whole is focused on an acronym called CBRN, which stands for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Explosive Threats, uh, Nuclear Threats. Um, and the vision of the center as a whole is to really be a premier provider for the solutions against CBRN and our, our branch specifically looking at the chemical and biological threats. Okay, here we go. So within my branch, um, I personally have been focusing on doing a lot of work regarding um, developing in vitro models for toxicology. Now, there are a lot of words there that some of you without a biological background might not understand. So I just like to give a little bit of background. Um, a few decades ago, the only option for really toxicology uh, tests and screenings were the animal model. So animals were really the standards for toxicology testing, whether it be larger animals such as pigs or ferrets, or smaller animals such as guinea pigs or mice as pictured um, in this photo. And as some of you may know, there are some major issues with animal testing. The first really being the ethical dilemma of using animals specifically for a lot of um, chemical and biological agents. Um, and the second issue is really looking at the physiological inaccuracies that come with animal testing as animal models cannot 100%, unfortunately, uh, encapsulate the human physiological system. So later on, scientists shifted over to using two-dimensional in vitro models, which in vitro just stands for um, outside the system or outside the body. So this normally you incorporated growing human cells in a 2D fashion outside of the body. These models were really good for complementing a lot of animal models, but still not 100% accurate. Um, and humans are three-dimensional uh, human beings, so we have certain properties that can really only be modeled in a three-dimensional environment. So this leads us to our current toxicological, 
toxicity um, screening method of three-dimensional in vitro models. So we see on the photo, um, we have current models and some of them are referred to as organ on a chip. So these are basically just small chips that are designed and developed to contain various human cells that can be simulated under three-dimensional micro environments. So the reason why it's called organ on a chip is because each chip can theoretically represent an organ, hence the name. Um, so some examples of this include lung on a chip, heart on a chip, uh, brain on a chip, and eventually we'd love to go to a system that encapsulates the full human on a chip. So organ on a chip technology has been utilized on a larger scale fashion by many commercial brands um, to offer kind of a complex a whole system called a microphysiological system, or in short, MPS, if I refer to that in later in the presentation, that's what uh, MPS stands for. And these systems incorporate a fully functional system that really supports these organ chips externally by controlling media supplements, flow rates, temperature, humidity, and other external factors uh, with, a computer, with a computer system. So when I joined the group back in November, the group already had two established commercially available systems. The first one is pictured on the left called Emulate Bio, which was really one of the original organ chip multi uh, MPS systems um, stemmed from the Wies Institute, uh, stemmed from Harvard University. And this system was really well, it was specializing single organs. So they had a lot of models that were fully established for the liver, the lung, the kidney, the heart on an individual scale. So the center was able to utilize the system to actually evaluate um, COVID-19 and the effects of the COVID-19 virus on the lung using the system. Along with COVID-19, um, the center has also tested various compounds and seen interesting results um, and compared them to more traditional 2D models and animal works. And we've seen that this system actually can yield a lot more comprehensive results about uh, certain agents. Now, our most current uh, recent work has actually been utilizing the tissue system, which has been shown on the right of the slide. And this system is extremely innovative as it actually incorporates multiple organs on a chip. So this chip picture, it has four slots and sections, and each of these slots, uh, an organ tissue, an organoid, or a tissue slice can actually be placed. Then flow is actually run through the system, and the effects of each organ on another can be evaluated when exposed to a certain agent or compound. And actually, we are currently doing a study evaluating three organs with this system, the skin tissue, the lung, and the heart, and we are really excited to see the results that stem from it. So after seeing some of the work that we have been doing with the commercially um, based systems, it was also important for us as scientists and engineers to find some of the limitations that the systems we were having with. Um, so this kind of introduces one of my main projects that I've been working on since I joined. And a significant limitation of the commercial systems is the inability to expose aerosols for predictive toxicology testing. So with our capabilities and with our systems that we currently had, there was nothing available that our center could use to test some of our aerosols of interest. Aerosols must be exposed with an open surface due to their nature, and current systems did not have that capability on their organ chips because a lot of their chips were closed and within a system and just couldn't handle aerosols. So as this graphic shows, the lung is a complex organ with both larger and smaller airways, which are of our particular interest, especially understanding the interactions between the epithelium and the endothelial layers in the lung. And when aerosols are exposed, what happens between those layers? So one of my projects, again, like I mentioned earlier, was to develop an open top lung chip that would be compatible with some of our capabilities within the center. And what was really cool about this project was it was with a collaboration with our makerspace lab within the engineering directorate with the center. So I was able to utilize engineering concepts such as computer aided design or CAD and various 3D printers, uh, specifically SLA or stereolithography. Um, currently our center had two existing um, aerosol delivery systems really meant for animal testing one on the top on this graphic that was meant for aerosol settling and the other with a nose cone system. Um, so rather than reinventing the wheel and developing the systems from scratch, our team decided to design and develop 3D printed adapters for these systems. So we could actually use the systems with our open top chips rather than animals, which they're originally supposed to be designed with. 
So for the aerosol settling system, we designed a hollow chamber that could hold up to eight chips as shown on the top of this graphic and could easily be um, incorporated and added onto the existing system. For the nose cone aerosol system, which is commonly used for animals, specifically mice, we designed two different adapter chambers for the open top chip. One, as you can see, um, would mimic the exact nose cone structure and another that had more of a flat design for better distribution. These adapters would allow us to easily add a single chip into our current systems that are really designed for animal testing. We also wanted to design our own customized chips so um, that were open top rather than closed in, like we mentioned that uh, the commercial systems had. So these were done uh, by designing multiple molds, uh, one for the top of the chip, one for the bottom of the chip, and also one for a lid to cover the chip once the ex aerosol exposures were done. So these molds were filled with polydimethyl oxane or PDMS, which is commonly used for developing organ chips and other microfluidic devices. And we also were able to design a mold for the thin membrane, which would go in between the top and the bottom of the chip to really emulate the epithelial and the endothelial layers of the lung. So the, right, uh, the top right photo shows our progress so far. Um, you can see all the parts that we were able to 3D print and um, some of the chips that we were also able to work with. Um, this photo is from about a month and a half ago. So there have been a lot more recent updates and prototypes, uh, but the chips have been very easy to reproduce and the material for the molds are made out of resin and the chips are made out of PDMS. And we are really excited to start testing um, aerosol delivery with our developments here. So overall, um, our DOD impact was really finding a limitation in the commercial systems we were using and developing chips and systems in-house specifically capable for our labs. So this project really helped expand our capabilities on understanding lung pathways and how um, various toxins and exposure might affect those pathways. And this was really our team's first attempt in creating an in-house system uh, developed with our makerspace labs, rather than depending on 100% other commercial and industry partners. And this project has also opened the door for potentially more customizations for future um, MPS work. And um, some collaborations include working with the engineering directorate within our center, as well as we worked with Penn State um, with some of the 3D printing work. I'd also like to mention for the tissue project that I mentioned earlier, um, it was a DITRA or Defense Reduction Agency collaboration project. And we're really excited to keep working with them in the future. So wrapping up the science portion of my talk, I do wanna kind of recognize the impact the SMART Scholarship Program has had on my very early career thus far. Uh, as a recruitment scholar for my undergraduate degree, I was really able to focus and customize my undergraduate experience as I knew exactly where I'd be heading after school. I knew I'd be in a research group, so I was trying, I was able to involve, get involved with research as early as a freshman in college and tried to gain as much relevant uh, wet lab skills um, so I'd be ready for when I started working. And um, another great thing about the program was that I got to meet a lot of my team members early on through the summer internship program. So when I joined full time, it was such an easy transition. I already knew most of my teammates and my coworkers. So I was really able to get started in the lab right away, uh, get my hands um, wet with all the work that we were doing. Um, I was really fortunate to be part of a really engaging team that also served as scientific mentors. So um, as early as the summer internships, I also gained a ton of scientific mentors, which was awesome because I got to turn to them throughout my undergraduate college experience, as well as my post-grad life. And now they're my coworkers, but they're still my scientific mentors. Um, and lastly, uh, in addition to all the exciting work that I've been able to talk about a little bit today, there's also a lot of... Um, cool innovative projects upcoming with the MPS efforts. So we have a potential bioprinting uh, project coming up to help complement some of our uh, in vitro work. So this project will kind of allow me to uh, further elevate my skills as a bioengineer. And hopefully I'll be able to present uh, some of that uh, in our next SMART Symposium uh, next year. So um, thank you so much for listening to my talk and I'm happy to answer um, any questions that anyone might have. Awesome. Thanks so much, Priscilla. There was a question in the chat that you just answered right after the question came up about what were the materials made of, uh, your, your, your chip materials. 
Um, yeah, so like I mentioned um, in the chat, the chip itself was made out of PDMS, which is a really common material um, used in Oregon on a chip technology and other microfluidic devices, but the mold itself were made out of resin. Um, so they're pretty simple materials, pretty affordable, nothing super complicated. Awesome. So cool how to see your, your focus studies go into your internship, go into your work, and then your excitement for your future work. So thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. And, and again, if anybody thinks of more questions for Priscilla, they can pop those into the Whova chat um, into the community board and she'll be happy to answer those. So thank you so much, Priscilla. Awesome. All right. Next up, we have Dr. Jose Whippold. Dr. Whippold is with the U.S. Army DevCom Army Research Laboratory SED, and his project title is The Big Impacts of the Little Things. Okay, so we'll move it over to Jose to share screen. Hey, everyone. I am getting my presentation. I think um, it's a nice segue from Priscilla's talk to mine. Uh, can I get a confirmation that my screen's being shared? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. Well, um, again, um, as the uh, I was introduced, my name is Jose Whippold, and it's worth mentioning, as other people have said, it would have been nice to have that irreplaceable human-to-human -human contact, but uh, I take solace in the fact that this is probably one of the last opportunities that I'm going to have to present while wearing a coat and tie um, paired with shorts and flip-flops, so that's nice. Um, I'm currently an R&D bioengineer with the DevCom Army Research Lab. Specifically, I'm a microfluidics engineer, a microchip uh, designer, and microfabrication specialist. I, uh, I work and live in the Washington, D.C. metro area. I got my uh, Bachelor's of Science in Bioengineering in 2014 from Louisiana State University, and my PhD in Biomedical Engineering in 2020 from Texas A&M. Um, so to introduce and in, in briefly demonstrate where uh, nanofabrication and microfabrication has gone. This is a, uh, a demo Eiffel Tower I fabricated in our clean room, um, which is, you know, a semiconductor processing uh, environment or laboratory. And so I made a, uh, you can see I have this penny for scale. Um, and I have a zoomed in image here. And then uh, with the uh, scanning electron microscopy, you can see that I have a, uh, a uh, two scale, one millionth of the size Eiffel Tower. This video shows it being fabricated in real time. You can see that uh, microfabrication, 3D printing, SLA techniques have gone uh, come really far. This video is at, what I just showed is actually a, uh, a, a more advanced form of fabrication called two photon polymerization, which I use in some of my research. Uh, as I mentioned, the organization I, I work for is part of the Department of Defense. It's the, uh, specifically the Department of the Army. Um, what we do is we make science work for the warfighters or soldiers. The overall mission is to operationalize science um, uh, for transformational overmatch. One of the biggest customers we have is the uh, Transform ERP. Uh, Transform stands for the, um, uh, the Transformational Symbio for Military Environments. ERPs are just essential research programs, and the overall goal of the program is to harness biology's capacity for uh, custom material production and modification of, uh, of material properties. Uh, so more into what uh, Transform does as a, as a program or in what we try to accomplish, is that's summarized in the uh, top left and middle list. Um, essentially what we wanna do is engineer novel organisms uh, and use biology to assemble advanced materials. We also want to control living materials in military relevant environments and the operating theater. Uh, the overall goal here is to advance concepts to enable an operational impact. Uh, the bottom graphic shows a roadmap of uh, where synthetic biology is today and where it might be going in the future with respect to uh, defense applications. So again, the title, The Big Impacts of the Little Things, I hope that begins to make sense as I continue talking about microfabrication and microfluidics along with uh, my experiences. For this talk, I'm gonna just briefly introduce who am I, um, talk about my phase one, um, smart phase one experiences, and then my fart smart uh, phase two uh, experiences so far as well. So a little bit about myself. Uh, born and raised in Houston, Texas, uh, had a pretty normal high school existence, 
played a couple sports, had a nice group of friends. Uh, most importantly, I was exposed to the importance of education uh, in an environment that made it cool to learn. Uh, I grew up in a multiracial, multicultural household. Uh, father was a Midwesterner from St. Louis, and my mother was a uh, uh, it's from a small province in the north of Spain called Asturias and a town called Oviedo. Um, I like to think that I inherited my uh, my father's fair skin and my mother's love for the sun, which uh, usually results in a, a pretty bad sunburn. Uh, I was able to spend uh, the, my summer months um, in Spain after you know finishing school and, and I would travel to Spain in the summers and uh, hang out with my family there. It was quite the unique experience and it exposed me to many things outside of my comfort zone and had me actively thinking about the contrast between the uh, uh, both types of societies. Uh, I mentioned this because little did I know at the time, but the ability to apply oneself and one's skills outside of your comfort zones enables you to grow not only as a person, but also as a scientist. So after high school, I followed perhaps my naive high school intuition and chose to go to Louisiana State University for pretty much all the reasons except academics. Um, I was a part of the honors college there and through LSU, I was able to experience many things from uh, developing you know, lasting friendships with some of my best friends today to experiencing yet another culture and way of life or as occasions say it, the joie de vie, uh, which literally means the joy of the life. Um, that is something I very much experienced through friends, food and uh, football games down there. Uh, academically, I started as a math major and then quickly switched to bioengineering. Uh, it was during my sophomore year that at the guidance of one of my professors that I joined a microfluidics research lab on campus in the chemical engineering department and got my first uh, hands-on research experience. Uh, as many of you may know, working in a lab while being a full-time student is quite difficult, so I sought out uh, other opportunities elsewhere. I was fortunate enough to email the right people and developed a relationship with a PI at Rice University, which is located in Houston, Texas, my hometown, and allowed me to work in their research lab um, during the summers I was away from campus. Uh, for grad school, I uh, went to a traditionally engineering uh, powerhouse in my home state at Texas A&M. Uh, at the request of my advisor, I went ahead and did a direct PhD. While, uh, and while I was there, I, I was able to surround myself with like-minded tech enthusiasts uh, that not only had uh, special technical skills, but also had a, a drive to create and innovate. Um, the main point of this slide is that uh, as a student, um, you know, whether it's you're starting your bachelor's or your grad school, you should be equally focused on developing yourself academically, as well as uh, finding yourself outside of the classroom. Uh, it's never a waste of time to find your passions and hobbies. So transitioning to um, you know, my phase one experiences, while at Texas A&M, I was funded for two years under an NSF grant, and then I joined uh, the SMART program in about the third year of my PhD. Uh, to reiterate what the past speaker said, you know, through SMART, uh, Smart you're able to broaden your skill set. Um, you're able to meet some very influential mentors, conduct research um, you know, for your graduate school without the requirement of teaching. Uh, that's something early on in grad school. I knew academia wasn't the route for me. So I was never too keen on teaching experiences. Um, also my sponsoring the facility worked in a tangential area of science that, um, you know, there was some overlap with what I did, but they um, needed a microfluidics uh, engineer to um, come in and um, make some chips for their projects and their ongoing endeavors. And so, you know, during grad school, I used microfluidics and building uh, microfluidic chips for antibody discovery. But through SMART, I was able to engage in connecting the dots between synthetic biology and microfluidics, which is something I would not have done had it not been for the SMART program. So to talk a little bit um, about microfluidics, I'll introduce the uh, basics here uh, to help paint a clearer picture. So microfluidics is uh, just considered by many as an essential tool for light, life science research, you know, in, in my microfluidics as a field really began when the transistor was invented and it was further put into motion by the uh, dawn of inkjet printing. It's been stated by the father of microfluidics who many consider to be George Whitesides from uh, Harvard that microfluidics has four parents, microelectronics, molecular biology, molecular analysis, and the most surprisingly of the four, national security. And that's because in 1994, DARPA invested heavily in lab on a chip for biodefense, which kickstarted the field. Um, you know, elucidated by the previous presentation, applications can be seen in uh, 
you know, in a variety of different commercial products, uh, spanning from drug analysis platforms, organ on chips, therapeutics, even modified soil additives. Uh, and a subset of microfluidics is droplet microfluidics, which uh, these droplets are pico to nanoliter scale bioreactors that you can process systematically through various known techniques that enable an automated uh, workflow and uh, analogous to uh, many traditional benchtop maneuvers, such as pipetting, clone selection, signal readout. Uh, the, you know, through the miniaturization and automation uh, made possible by microfluidics and nanofluidics, you're able to achieve an improved experimental precision, you're able to lower your limits of detection, and you're able to run massively parallel uh, experimentation. So this is one of my um, favorite slides uh, that's favorite and most challenging. And uh, it's my favorite because it shows the portfolio of work I've completed. Um, it's my most challenging because it, um, while high level and superficially, it reduces my PhD into a single slide. Um, to explain what's going on here, there are two main avenues one can take in order to further the, further the state of the art of microfluidic device advancement. You can either take a functionality-based approach or an application-based approach. Functionality-based approaches would be developing microfluidic capabilities, whether it's incorporating novel flow profiles, droplet merging techniques, or inline filtering techniques. And these help bridge the technical gaps that uh, in the challenges that the field faces. An application-based uh, approach takes advantage of the, the tremendous amount of work done in functionality-based research and applies these advances uh, in order to achieve new on-chip biological and chemical analysis, whether it be to test a new drug compound on a new lung on a chip system or screening for high toxin producing bacteria in droplets. Uh, my uh, PhD research was equally devoted to these two spaces. Um, for my application-based research, I um, developed uh, and prototyped a chip called Prescient, which is, uh, stands for the Platform for the Rapid Evaluation of Antibody Success Using Integrated Microfluidics Enabled Technology. And so what this chip was able to do is it was able to rapidly screen whether antibodies produced by a single uh, antibody producing cell was capable of neutralizing viruses at extremely high throughputs. Uh, to segue into, um, you know, where I currently stand as a, a phase two fellow, um, you know, this is just a, a brief introduction to my journey as an engineer and to my career as a, uh, a government scientist. So uh, to give a high level overview of my technical work, uh, I'll talk about two projects that I have ongoing. Um, you know, as I mentioned uh, before, or you might know, synthetic biology, it's a useful technological approach to develop novel systems uh, in health, energy, agrotech, and chemical related channels. Um, Symbio research and development, uh, it's usually classified into three parts. First is synthetic uh, biology, um, is the designing for a predictable biology. Next, the assembly of DNA into bioparts. Uh, and third is developing ways to prototype these synthetic systems and uh, characterize the individual uh, components. The project I have ongoing um, is called DNA and Trap, uh, and it aims to address facets of these three main focuses in an all-encompassing uh, platform or uh, uh, microfluidic chip. And so a good portion of this work stems from some of my PhD research, and it's a uh, you know, the main intellectual component of some of the IP we have developed at uh, the Army Research Lab. Uh, the overall goal of this project is to be able to uh, deliver DNA into mili military relevant microbes. Um, so why would you want to do this? Well, by doing this, you'll be able to drive synthetic biology towards developing novel biosensors, new uh, self-healing materials, and potentially smart coatings. Uh, so with respect to current and naturally occurring DNA transfer mechanisms. The most common for horizontal gene transmission among bacteria are transformation, transduction, and conjugation. Um, to skip ahead um, and uh, avoid all the details, this uh, platform uses, uh, will, will uh, leverage conjugation. Um, and conjugation is the transfer of DNA from a living donor cell to a living recipient cell by direct cell to cell contact. Um, the ability to Conjugate other cells is encoded by donors, in the donors by plasmas or transposons. Um, and yeah, this will be the approach uh, DNA and TRAP facilitates. Uh, on the right, you could see some, you know, there are current limitations of synthetic biology. 
you know, as a field that include experimental variability, time consuming discovery phases, and many costly other unknowns. Uh, the biggest limitation to the development of novel synthetic biology toolkits is a lack of high throughput testing equipment that can tackle the diversity that biology is capable of producing. This again is where microfluidics will play a key enabling role. Uh, it allows for the high throughput modification in, um, in high throughput screening platforms. Uh, there are commercial tools that can help, um, but the current gold standard technology uh, is limited in that targeted alleles could carry unintended uh, modifications. There are brute force methods that have relatively low efficiency, and um, many others are only compatible with uh, specialized laboratory strains of um, you know, animal, plant, bacterial cells. And we really want to be able to engineer these unknown environmental samples that might be out in the uh, wherever the warfighter finds uh, themselves. So to take all these technologies together, the same commentation, common limitations um, that you know developing and setting up target modifications from scratch is cost prohibitive, time consuming, prone to human error, and lacks the throughput and condition screening in order to achieve your synthetic engineering goal in a timely fashion. Using my DNA and trap uh, approach, we envision the ability to screen a million, um, the ability to conjugate, conjugate a million different isolates in under, uh, um, in, you know, in, in under four days. Um, to put this in perspective, having a team of 25 scientists in both a day and night shift um, do the same benchtop protocol that m one million uh, experiments would take over 50 years. So you can see the potential gain in doing something that previously took 50, 50 years, now able to do this and run these experiments in four days as a, an, an extremely uh, beneficial and enabling technology. Uh, moving on to my second body of work um, that I'm spearheading, I'm calling it the K-chip. Uh, the K-chip here is really, um, it's supposed to be a kappa, which is the Greek sign for binding affinity. Uh, the overall problem is that not a lot of uh, good adhesives for hydrophobic polymers exist. Um, we want to make biomimetic materials that will ultimately be cheaper than biological materials. Uh, this work comes through a collaboration between my biotechnology division and the weapons uh, and materials research directorate um, at ARL. So using the existing protocol, um, the, uh, my colleague at, from WMRD, uh, he was able to purchase a commercial and off-the-shelf chip that could run a single condition uh, screening, a single assay at a single time. Where I come into play is I develop the uh, diversity and testing component. So as you can imagine, large diverse libraries can benefit from uh, higher throughput screening modalities. Um, my colleagues there developed a large library of test combinatorial sequences, um, think in the uh, hundreds of thousands of millions, and each individual sequence needs to be screened for binding properties. Uh, so what we can do with this K-chip, which you can see a picture of the prototype that I have right now, um, is that what I'll, this K-chip will help um, my colleagues screen what used to take uh, a library that used to take one year. They can now do that in under 15 days. So that wraps up the brief high level introduction to my technical work. Um, as mentioned in the, towards the beginning of the presentation, a lot of my work is funded through Transforming ERP. Uh, well, another big customer I have doing, uh, I have is doing work for my smart seed grant. Seed grants allow for early phase two scientists and engineers to propose and lead their own projects as PI. The title of my work is the development of next gen microfluidic high throughput screening tools for military relevant synthetic biology applications. And moving on from the seed grant, another item worth mentioning is uh, from the uh, SMART programs uh, is the Scholar Mentor of the Year uh, Award for which my mentor and I received an honorable mention. Uh, it, it was nice to be considered for such an award that had uh, such an accoladed list of applicants and recipients. And for some very important acknowledgements, I'd like to, uh, to mention Dr. Brain Adams, who has been a fantastic mentor for all things synthetic biology and beyond. Uh, Dr. Jamita shias Colum, who is instrumental in, um, in me becoming a SMART fellow for the uh, Army Research Laboratory back in 2017. And of course, forever indebted to my PhD advisor, Dr. Arum Han, who um, really helped me develop my skills as a microfluidic engineer and a scientist. And of course, no one's story is uh, complete without the mention of the life outside the lab, uh, my wife, my cat, and my dog. Um, that, 
And I would also quickly just like to shout out to the other smart phase one fellows from the biotech division at uh, the Army Research Lab. And that is uh, Monica Chu, currently studying at University of Maryland College Park, Megan Adler from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and uh, Kelsey Gray from uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And that's it. Thank you for having me talk today, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the presentations. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Whipple. And yeah, again, congratulations on your you know, Scholar Mentor of the Year. You dropped a good plug for the seed grant. All of those are wonderful um, uh, avenues that you can take advantage of as a rock star or smart scholar. So it was really fun to watch your presentation and see how much uh, passion you bring to, to your work. Um, there was a question that I think you could take offline from a fellow Aggie that wants to know a little bit more about your startup, Aggie Land. But um, unfortunately, we're going to have to move to our next presenter. So look forward to seeing that um, in our chat. So thanks so much. <laughs> All righty. Next, um, moving along, we have Dr. El <laughs> Dr. Evelyn uh, Ligon. Uh, Dr. Ligon is with the U.S. Army Defense Forensic Science Center with her project titled Enhancing Operational Capabilities. So we'll move on over to uh, Dr. Ligon. Thank you very much for the introduction. I have a lot of ground to cover, so I am gonna move really quickly, but just to quickly um, introduce myself again, I am Dr. Evelyn Ligon. I came in with the uh, 2015 uh, Smart Recruitment Cohort while I was working on my PhD in chemistry from Georgia Tech. And I have worked at DIFC FXD, my sponsoring facility for the last three years. Uh, this is my presentation and does not reflect the views of the Department of the Army or Department of Defense at large. Any references to commercial products are incidental and do not reflect endorsement or exclusivity, and all images are used with permission. So uh, the Defense Forensic Science Center uh, supports the entire DOD with forensic capabilities, um, but we are a multi-directorate agency with traditional and battlefield capabilities, as well as a research and quality arm. USACIL, which is the US Army Criminal Investigation Laboratory, is the traditional forensic capability. Uh, they work cases that are prosecutable under Title 10. So that is military criminal cases. On the other hand, FXD, the Forensic Exploitation Directorate, is a battlefield capability. Uh, we support counterterrorism intelligence efforts at the various COCOMs in deployed locations. So my job as an FXD chemist is to deploy to these COCOMs and perform forensic chemical analysis on captured exploitable material captured exploitable material or chem in order to support these efforts. And we're looking for chemical signatures that indicate explosives, drugs, poisons, or general unknowns. As a chemist, I deploy with a forensic exploitation team to various forensic exploitation labs. So if you hear FXT or FXL during this talk, that's what I'm talking about. These labs are meant to be customizable to the requested mission. So as a chemist, I typically deploy as the sole chemist um, with all of these other examiners that represent the different forensic disciplines. My primary job is the safety of everyone that's involved in this mission. So that includes my teammates that are working evidence and may uncover some suspected hazardous material during their evidence exploitation but it also includes the troops that are responding to scenes and bringing evidence back to the lab to us. I am available for consult at any time during the evidence collection and handling process to ensure that our people are safe. And when a troop or when, a, when personnel are responding to a scene, if they have contextual information about the event, they can call me in advance to ask for my advice on what types of material to collect specifically for chemistry exploitation. So when we're talking about drugs and explosives, the best case scenario for evidence to bring to me would be some type of bulk material, likely a solid such as a powder or a pellet or, um, or a prill. The more material that we have to exploit that is intact, the deeper amount of intelligence we can provide to our submitters. That's because we can do multiple replicate analyses, multiple chemical manipulations, and generally improve our sensitivity by upping the concentration of what we put onto our instruments. But like I said, that's the best case scenario. And that's usually only going to happen if military personnel stumble upon a manufacturing site where explosives are being made or recover unexploded ordnance from a scene, 
or arrest a target that has these materials on them. More than likely, they'll be responding to a post-blast incident. And post-blast evidence that can contain chemical signatures for me to exploit will include fragmentation or shrapnel from an exploded device, soil that's recovered from the crater of impact or the blast seat of an explosion, and swabs taken from vehicles and buildings in the blast radius. We can actually recover intact high explosives pretty easily from those types of evidence, but we can also recover post-combustion products that clue us in to what type of event occurred. Moving over to the drug side of things, um, we can exploit again, tablets, capsules. Uh, we can exploit syringes that may have contained liquids. Uh, typical drug paraphernalia, such as pipes or spoons or straws. Um, and also plant material. So if someone is manufacturing uh, drugs such as cocaine or heroin, we can exploit coca leaf and opium to make those determinations. All of this feeds into intelligence efforts to uncover the enemy's TTP, which is tactics, techniques, and procedures. Usually a bomb maker is going to follow the same type of bomb recipe every single time. And this will be due either to their expertise the availability of resources, or some combination thereof. When we find unique chemical signatures that are consistent with only one particular region of the world or one specific terrorist organization that uses the same bombs every time, that is important evidence that can be almost as useful or as useful as a biometric hit. Rather than just finding the person responsible for emplacing a device, we've identified the organization responsible for an attack. And when we discover what those precursor materials are that are used to make those explosive devices, we can start to um, interrupt supply chains, restrict or otherwise restrict access to those materials. This will prevent them from being able to make more explosive devices and will prevent future attacks. This over time also, as we do these chemical analyses, the information that we provide to our Intel analysts will be archived for future reference. And the intelligence network can begin to develop trends and statistics to figure out either what the enemy is up to, where they may be moving to, what new suppliers they could have. So chemistry exploitation is essential for intelligence work. Um, I mentioned before that there is usually one chemist per FXT. In addition to safety, I am also responsible for maintaining and repairing all of my own instrumentation, as well as uh, serving as a safety officer and chemical inventory manager for the whole lab. And of course, responding to requests for information. Where we fit within the greater uh, lab intelligence community out overseas, um, is at a level two operational capability. With the analytical suite that we have access to downrange, which includes infrared, X-ray diffractometry, X-ray fluorescence, and gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, we can identify a wealth of organic and inorganic materials that are common to drugs and explosives. And we can obtain, and we can obtain that information at the proper sensitivity, structural elucidation, um, and yeah, yeah, st and structural elucidation and mixture resolution. Um, so we can analyze very complex matrices for these chemical signatures. In addition, these are benchtop instruments and they are very robust. They can withstand very high temperatures and very high humidity, which is typical for the types of combat regions that we're sent to. Um, we're able to provide our analysis in as little as 72 hours. And that includes all of the quality instrument control measures that we have to take and sending our reports back home for 100% peer review prior to submitting those to, these, to the requesting uh, submitter. However, occasionally we cannot identify everything that's in a mixture. So we can send the evidence or an extract of the evidence back home to a level three lab at stateside. These are strategic labs and that includes USACIL and our FXD home lab at Gillam Enclave. Um, the benefits of strategic capabilities are all of the instruments that I've already discussed, plus additional LCMS, SEM, among others, that improve sensitivity and can do more isomeric differentiation and elemental analysis. However, the cost is time. It could take upwards of months to archive the information from these cases and make them available to the intelligence community. 
If a commander wants to make a quick decision about which terrorist organization to target, it would be much better for them to send it to a level two lab where we can give you that information in three days and help point out the terrorist organization that's responsible. Not to forget the level one labs, which are the tactical labs that, uh, that initially respond to a scene. These are typically EOD teams that have handheld equipment that they bring on site with them. And they're able to get a very quick but more general assessment of the hazards present before penetrating more deeply into a scene. The title of my presentation is Enhancing Operational Capabilities, and I'd like to take the next few minutes to discuss some case studies of real cases that I worked on a deployment to AFRICOM last year and how we were able to push the limits of chemical analysis in the midst of casework. Uh, this first case study is for an explosive mixture that I received in AFRICOM. Um, I will go through our case workflow uh, just to showcase it uh, in the process of presenting this case. Um, the first step is always a visual examination under a stereo microscope. I want to know if there are any particles of interest that can be visually discriminated from the rest of the mixture and analyzed independently. In this case, this was a very homogeneous black granular substance that was coated in some kind of oily matrix. So not seeing anything to isolate, I took a portion of the neat sample to FTIR. This gave me a good reading for either nitroglycerin or nitrocellulose, which appear very similar by FTIR. I then ground up a portion of the sample and began to look at it by XRF and XRD. XRF gave me elemental analysis to include sodium, sulfur, and potassium. And my XRD analysis was able to differentiate a mixture that included potassium nitrate and sodium sulfate. So those results were all consistent with each other. Next, I did an organic extraction in dichloromethane of the NEAT sample and took it to GCMS. The soluble portion in solution was revealed to be nitroglycerin, which agreed well with our FTIR results. However, there was also a portion of sample that did not dissolve in the dichloromethane and left a black powder in the bottom of the extraction vessel. I recovered that black powder and took it back to FTIR and was able to confirm again that potassium nitrate was present. We reported this out to our Intel analysts and the customer as, a, as an explosive mixture containing nitroglycerin, potassium nitrate, and sodium sulfate. And in fact, our intelligence analyst was able to connect this mixture to a, to a specific terrorist organization. This was a very specific regional homemade explosive that had been seen in numerous incidents recently. And according to the submitter, we were the first lab to be able to identify sodium sulfate in the mixture. So the investigation is ongoing to determine what the purpose of the sodium sulfate might be in that mixture. Next, I will present a drug case study. Um, this was, I received a couple of cases of cot while I was working in AFRICOM. Cot is a leaf that is chewed like tobacco in order to extract the cat, in order to extract cathinone and caffeine directly into the bloodstream. Cathinone has a very strongly hallucinogenic effect, which is why it is considered schedule one in the United States. Uh, caffeine is less hallucinogenic, but has stimulant properties to it, similar to caffeine, and it's considered a schedule four drug. The first time that I worked caught in theater, I had very limited sample to work with. And so playing it safe, I did a methanol extraction, which is good at extracting general drugs, but also unfortunately plant alkaloids. And as you can see from this very messy uh, GCMS extract, wherein the primary peak is actually lupiol, I was only able to achieve a very small amount of extraction of the drug of interest, caffeine, which is that very small peak right at four, right at six minutes. However, before I received my next case of COT, I worked with my technical leaders to identify peer-reviewed literature to see if there was a better extraction protocol for this plant material. In fact, we found a couple of different peer-reviewed articles, and we found that those, uh, those protocols very closely matched our existing in-house procedure for opium. So modifying that existing protocol with a target, P with a target pH of about 12, and then extracting it into DCM, I was able to achieve this very beautiful extraction of both cathinone and caffeine the next time we received a cot case in theater. 
the last case that I will present is um, actually fueled a research project that is ongoing and that I've been participating in. Uh, many explosives will uh, either will be mixed with some type of hydrocarbon based fuel. So that could be something like gasoline or diesel fuel, either as an accelerant or as the fuel source itself. Um, I, ignitable liquids are very well studied uh, due to their prevalence in arson cases, and there are very good ASTM and OSAC standard methods to be able to classify those types of products. However, it is much harder to both extract and detect and classify heavier weight, more solid hydrocarbon products, such as waxes, petroleum jellies, and motor oils. And we wanted to enhance our own ability, not only to present better, more specific information to the customer, but be able to perform that analysis in theater. So in association with our research arm, the Office of the Chief Scientist, I've been working as an associate investigator to improve our existing GCMS methods and determine if there is a standard way to identify these heavier weight hydrocarbons as specific hydrocarbon products. That was just a brief overview of the work I've been doing. I'd like to take this time now to thank the SMART Scholarship for Service, both for funding uh, my, my graduate studies and for giving me the opportunity to present today. It's been a long journey to get here. Um, I started at Georgia Tech like I said, in 2014, applied for the 2015 SMART recruitment cohort. Um, along with my best friend pictured here, Dr. Brianne Ellis, uh, we were both accepted into the SMART program by the same sponsoring facility. So eight years later, I work at Dipsy FXD with my best friend. Uh, while I was working for uh, my sponsoring facility during the summer internship portion, um, I did a combined project between USACIL and OCS to synthesize novel benzodiazepine positional isomers and characterize them for forensic analysis. Uh, this work has culminated into one full paper, one letter, one manuscript pending, and two presentations at different forensic conferences, as well as an educational partnership agreement between Georgia Tech and DIFSI. This will not only enable future collaboration, but enabled me to graduate on time because I could incorporate this research into my thesis work. The rest of these photos are from my time in FXD and from my deployment in AFRICOM. Um, I have deployed, or not deployed, I have traveled to other interesting locations uh, with this agency to include South Korea, uh, but I had a wealth of experience in AFRICOM that really highlights the uniqueness of our mission and what we're able to achieve in FXD. Um, this picture where we're all wearing masks is with an EOD team that we were able to do a joint uh, Gemini training with. Uh, this is a handheld instrument that can be used for on-site exploitation. So that was a good way to liaise with our partners on location. Uh, we were also able to facilitate many um, explosives familiarization exercises with uh, canine units stationed overseas. Um, did a lot of sightseeing while I was in AFRICOM uh, to include this visit to a nature reserve where we were up close and personal with cheetahs, ostriches, and baboons, among other local animals. And then finally, this last photo that I'm pretty proud of, um, we, in collaboration with the U.S. Air Force Combat Camera Unit stationed in AFRICOM, we were able to film a promotional video um, of our overseas lab. This is available on YouTube and it is called We Are the JT FAC, JTFAC. Um, anybody that's interested in what our entire unit does, so all of the forensic disciplines involved, should definitely go and check out that video. So again, I would like to thank the SMART program for hosting me today. Thanks to all of you for your attention and I will take any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Ligon. Um, there is a brief question here, uh, and it looks as though, let's see, you mentioned weapons and drugs were the main category, uh, categories that were analyzed. Um, were there any other categories that were studied? Um, and we just have a very brief amount of time for that. Sure. Um, we do exploit drugs and explosives most of the time. Um, on my first slide, I mentioned poisons. Um, we are not a seaburn capability. So if anything is submitted to us that's more like a chemical weapon, we're going to forward that to one of our seaburn partners. Uh, but we have looked at solid phase 
poisons before. Um, and we can do that kind of work in our lab. In, in the term of general unknowns, um, that's typically any time that a suspected hazardous material is pulled off of a personnel or off of evidence. Maybe it's everything looks like a white powder, so we want to make sure that it's not hazardous. We will still report it out to the customer, even if it's something totally innocuous like sodium chloride. Um. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And again, if more questions come in, you can put them in this chat or you can move them over to the Whova app. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Ligon. And so awesome that you and your, your best friend get to apply for the scholarship and then work together. So really neat on that. All right. All right. Next up, we have Dr. Caitlin Detweiler. Uh, Dr. Detweiler is with the Air Force Research Laboratory Materials and Manufacturing Directorate. And her project title is High Temperature Ceramics for Aerospace Applications. Turn over to you, Dr. Detweiler. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Let me uh, share here. And if there's computer issues, I'd like to blame it on the government computer, but it's probably going to be my fault. Uh, <laughs> oh. All right, are we in slideshow view? Yes. Okay, okay. Great. great. All right, so yep, I'm Katie Detweiler. I uh, recently converted from a phase one to a phase two scholar. I uh, wrapped up my PhD in material science this May actually. So I'm about three weeks in as a full-time engineer over at wright Pi Air Force Base and the materials and manufacturing directorate. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with AFRL, there's uh, nine technology directorates and uh, the materials and manufacturing directorate is one of those uh, that's located at, met, oh, there's a couple different materials and manufacturing directorates, but I'm at wright Pat Air Force Base. And we all have a common mission to lead the discovery, development and integration of affordable war fighting technologies for our air, space and cyberspace forces. So what that, means in my world, uh, being at the materials directorate, is I am looking at materials that uh, can be applied for aerospace applications. Um, there's many different materials that are looked at in our directorate, including metals, ceramics, polymers, semiconductors, composites, and biomaterials. And I live in the ceramics and composites world. Um, so I sit in the composites performance research team and anybody who may have uh, a little bit of uh, familiarity with material science may recognize this uh, material science tetrahedron. This is, um, I don't know, something you learn in your material science 101 courses. So basically, um, I'm evaluating material performance and trying to link that performance to the processing uh, material microstructure and materials properties. So, um, basically, what I'm doing is testing materials through a litany of different methods, including uh, oxidation testing, mechanical testing, and then, uh, as I'll get into in a little bit, and uh, combined oxidation and mechanical testing, and seeing um, how those could be used, those materials could be used for Air Force applications. Um, once we evaluate that material with um, experimental testing, we use physics-based modeling um, to try to predict that material behavior for service conditions, um, and again, making those uh, different linkages. So we have a couple of different application areas within the composites performance team. There is polymer matrix composites, which are lightweight load-bearing structures, and those typically experience uh, lower temperatures during flight profiles. There's also uh, functional composites or electromagnetic EM composites, and those um, are some material that have some sort of functionality to them that's beyond just a load-bearing part. And then finally, what I focus on is the ceramic matrix composites, or I might refer to them as CMCs. And these, compared to um, metal alloys, have relatively lower densities and higher temperature capabilities. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more about what a CMC is. So for my dissertation work, um, I was in contact and working at AFRL uh, on this project with them a lot. And I was looking at 
what a CMC is, is a ceramic fiber embedded in a ceramic matrix. And in this case, I'm looking at silicon carbide fibers with a boron nitride fiber coating and then a silicon carbide matrix. And these materials, uh, as I mentioned, are known for their high temperature capabilities, but the um, one of my funding sources was Rolls-Royce and for their CMC components, they're actually experiencing much lower temperatures. They call this the intermediate temperature range from 600 to 800 C for this class of materials. And this temperature is experienced during idling or cruising. So quite a significant duration of the flight profile. So I was tasked with um, understanding the oxidation and mechanical performance in this temperature regime. So I did this through a litany of different methods, some of my work at UVA or University of Virginia, and then some of the work at AFRL. And the first method was an unstressed oxidation study. And in this case, I had uh, a coupon that was hung and suspended from a sensitive microbalance. And I was able to track weight change during elevated temperature exposures. And then I could use this weight change to elucidate some of the oxidation mechanisms for the material. Um, specifically, I'd like to point out that the silicon carbide fibers would show some oxidation as well as um, those boron nitride fiber coatings I mentioned. I also um, performed micro cracking analysis and this was um, looking at the mechanical performance in the absence of oxidation. So this tensile stage, this is what's called a micro tensile stage. And we're um, looking at um, samples that are much smaller in um, size than typical. So when you perform a large full scale mechanical test, your samples may be seven inches long um, by a couple, uh, like half an inch wide. And in this case, the sample is about an inch long. And then we're looking at maybe a couple millimeters wide. So a much smaller scale that we're getting at. And I will touch more on that as that's some of the work I really focus on at AFRL. Uh, I was also uh, tasked with obtaining baseline mechanical properties. That's that macro scale testing I just mentioned. And then um, performing some oxidation modeling of my material um, using different material properties that I obtained and then trying to predict the oxidation behavior. And this oxidation model um, that was previously formulated was actually by some of my colleagues at AFRL that I'm now working with. And then finally, I won't touch on it today, but um, the overall goal was to implement all the knowledge that I learned from these subtasks into a much larger uh, task in performing stressed oxidation testing in different environmental conditions. So all this work was done to bridge the gap between the understanding of oxidation and mechanical behavior as a function of environment load and temperature. And I'd like to point out, um, this is gonna turn red here, that these tasks that are in red, I was able um, to do at AFRL, and that really supported a lot of my dissertation work. For example, uh, the micro cracking analysis, I would not have been able to complete that because I didn't have the equipment and um, microscopes that I needed uh, available for me at UVA. So this was awesome to be able to do at AFRL. Um, I mentioned that the CMC oxidation model uh, was formulated by some of my AFRL colleagues. And then finally, the baseline mechanical properties. I eventually got this capability at UVA to do this mechanical testing, but being at AFRL was awesome because I learned from a bunch of experts in the field on how to properly run mechanical tests. And it really allowed me to have a big jump start in my research and, uh, understanding of um, performing that work. So to touch a little bit more on the uh, micro or mini tensile testing at AFRL, I really wanna highlight this because this was something I started in my grad school work, but we're actually gonna be continuing with some different materials. So it's awesome that like through the SMART internship, I was able to start establishing some of my work and projects uh, as an intern and now able to kind of hit the ground running as an engineer uh, now as a civilian engineer, so it's pretty awesome. So with this work, I was using uh, light and scanning electron microscopy to evaluate micro cracking behavior. So this is an image that I obtained from the light microscope and anything that you can see marked here 
was a crack that was running through the material. And I obtained a novel measure or a novel measurement um, called micro crack composition. So you can see that these are marked in different colors. And um, that means that it's running through a different constituent. And when we think back that I'm doing oxidation work, your oxidation mechanisms are going to depend on what constituent your crack is in contact with. So this was really a way for me to highlight that um, we need to start considering these micro crack compositions when we're performing our oxidation modeling. And that's something that I hope to implement into um, that oxidation model when I work with the uh, modeling team. I also obtained micro crack spacing, which is just uh, spacing between the different uh, cracks that pop into the material. And this helps to predict uh, CMC lifetime. And then finally, crack opening displacement. And this was a major measurement that I could use in that AFRL CMC oxidation model. So this work, as I mentioned, is going to be continuing on some different materials. And we're um, starting to really shore up our capabilities on this microtensile testing side. We go. All right, so our research impact. Um, I mentioned this is definitely an Air Force relevant material for jet engine applications. So we were able to evaluate it in that uh, intermediate temperature regime and try to get at uh, different lifetime predictions for different environmental conditions. And from the work, uh, I didn't touch on it, but when you start adding water vapor into that environment, you increase the amount of oxidative degradation. And when we start opening up more of those micro cracks that I showed you, that obviously you know, allows more oxidant into the material and we really um, ramp up our oxidation, which then results in failure of the material. So we need to be able to recognize those different regimes and then plan for them in the um, service application. And then finally, it was, um, I evaluated the CMC oxidation model for the CMC and um, it was not applicable in its current condition. So that's another thing that we're gonna continue to work on. Uh, as far as my collaborators and acknowledgements for the work, uh, Rolls-Royce, US and UK, um, this was a really nice partnership between Rolls-Royce and AFRL. We'd already had contacts between the two and um, I'd previously worked on uh, Rolls-Royce material within uh, AFRL before, so it was uh, just a nice continuation of previous work. And then I'd also like to thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Beth Opila and the entire research group at UVA. So I'd also like to touch on the SMART impact on me. So with SMART, um, I got a lot more mentorship than I would have had if I had not done SMART. So that was awesome. I mentioned uh, learning how to run those uh, mechanical tests from some of the biggest experts in the field was a big plus. Uh, I'd also really like to point out the financial support. Uh, undergraduates and grad students know the, the struggling student life. So it was, you know, a big weight off the shoulders to have that additional financial support um, from SMART and really allowed me to focus on my research and studies. Um, as far as completing the internship, you know, I mentioned I was able to complete a bunch of different work that I wouldn't have been able to do before. Um, and attending those internships allowed me to get an increased understanding of my sponsoring facilities mission. Uh, as previous speakers have mentioned, you know, networking with your future colleagues is a big plus and you really get integrated into your team prior to uh, starting full time. And then, um, you know, getting started on some of those projects before I start full time is a good stepping stone. Uh, you know, as you go through the like life in the DOD, you get to work with state-of-the-art technology. It's, you know, you're always on the cutting edge and it's just, it, it's fun to work with that uh, equipment. And then, you know, I can't complain about the travel to different conferences that I get to do. Um, there's opportunities for international and just regular national conferences. So there's a lot of travel that you can do and present your work and, um, just speak with other researchers out in the field. So, you know, I can't thank SMART enough for the opportunity that I was given. So with that, I will take uh, any questions on the work. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Detweiler. Um, if there are any questions, looks like there's none currently, but I'm sure there will be. So we'll just ask that those get popped into the chat. Thank you so much for your presentation. And again, I, another smart scholar that's 
just I'm always so blown away by the amount of you know care and attention to your your studies that then pour over into the mission of the DoD and the passion that you bring that. Um, it's always wonderful to see, um, and hopefully we'll we'll have more face to face um you know interactions in the future. So thank you so much, Dr. Detweiler. Yeah. Um, and again, uh, there if you have questions, uh, please do pop them in the chat, and we'll be sure to get those answered for you. Good. Next, uh, we do have Patrick Fedick. All right, so Patrick Fedick is with the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division uh, with the project title of Accelerated Formation of Energetic Precursors Through Confined Volume Reactors and Subsequent Scale-Up. So Patrick, go ahead and share your screen and we'll look forward to your presentation. Am I up? I can see it, thanks. All right, awesome. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, like I said, my name is Patrick Fedick. Uh, I am in phase three of the uh, SMART program. Um, when I was in phase one, I was at Purdue University where I did my doctorate, um, specifically in mass spectrometry at uh, Purdue University. So at the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division, um, we are, lo I'm located in the chemistry division, uh, which is housed within the research department. So our cohort is a little bit different in the fact that we have about 20 some PhD PIs and we're kind of structured like academia where all 20 of us go out and get our own grant dollars, work on our own research projects. We collaborate quite often and we're kind of broken into the synthetic group, um, the analytical group, and then the polymer uh, group. Um, but again, we all kind of play in the same sandbox and, and collaborate through. So even though I'm primarily in that center analytical group, um, I also do um, some synthetic work, which is what I'll talk to you guys about today. I'm um, really coming at it though from an analytical perspective. So uh, I run the mass spectrometry uh, center as well as um, what we call the rapid prototyping lab. Um, so we have 20 some mass spectrometers, pretty much any capability that you could um, ever hoped for, as well as we have a number of uh, 3D printers, um, whether it's your fused deposition modeling, you know, benchtop ones up to uh, the really expensive um, high temperature printers that could do PEAK and uh, PKK, um, as well as some of the SLA printers. Uh, I was just watching four this weekend and right in the, the opening scenes uh, in the one lab, there's the nice SLA printer and I'm nudging my wife. I said, oh man, I have one of those in my lab right now. And she just kind of rolled her eyes. But anyway, um, so we're, my, my research group is split pretty much between environmental projects, uh, primarily PFAS and pyrotechnics, and then also in energetics. So I'm going to pick one of the, the three main areas that we deal with in energetics. Um, but really our energetics portfolio is high throughput reaction screening, um, online reaction monitoring to try to look at different energetic pathways, and then the projects that I'll talk to you guys about today is um, accelerating uh, the, the product formation of energetics and some of their precursors. So if I were to ask you to draw a picture of a synthetic chemist uh, doing a chemical reaction, you would likely draw an individual in front of a fume hood, uh, some colorful chemicals, refluxing, bubbling, some complex glassware, something like that. Um, we take a completely different approach. So we use these techniques called confined volume reactors. Um, and they kind of include uh, micro droplets, thin films, light and frost droplets to, to name the, the main few. Um, and we apply these confined volume reactors uh, for accelerating the formation of, of product within energetic or explosive uh, reaction schemes. Um, so if you look at the images on the right, it shows some of our confined volume um, setups. Many of these come from mass spectrometry ion sources, so easy um, ESSI, nano ESI, and paper spray, um, PSI down in the bottom, are all mass spec um, ion sources, um, with the last one, line and frost droplets, um, are in a class of their own. Not, they have nothing to do with mass spec, but another way of uh, accelerating reactions. So these confined volume reactors have unique kinetics, and compared to solution phase reactions, um, require much less activation energy um, that they have to overcome to form products. So if you look on the left, you know, and you go back to gen chem or organic, and you have to get over that hump to, uh, and, and 
put in that activation energy to go and form your product. Um, solution phase, you can see in the green trace, there's there's quite a bit of energy that you need to go to. Gas phase, collisionally based. So, you know, molecule A, molecule B, bump into each other, boom, you form products. Um, we are in this, what what's thought to be as a partially solvated uh, state. So due to the desolvation, um, there's an enhancement to the reactivity of the micro droplets and thin films. Um, you're concentrating the reactant uh, solution. You're increasing the mass transfer efficiency inside the droplet. There's rapid mixing, um, increased pH effects. Um, you're increasing the surface to volume ratio, um, which effectively increases the concentration of the reactant molecules on the droplet surface or the thin film surface, uh, where there's expected to have the most reactivity. Um, and we can monitor the acceleration factor uh, and, and how we're changing this, this acceleration um, by comparing the signal intensity of, of the ratio of the product to reactant in our confined volume reactor against the ratio of product to reactant in the solution phase, so your traditional round bottom flask chemistry that, you know, again, you would have had imagined from the start of this talk, um, for discrete time points. So let's say we wait for five minutes and we compare our confined volume to our bulk, um, and then we see how much more product we formed in one versus the other. So one recent example uh, that my group has explored is the accelerated product formation of the precursor to trinitrobenzene. So we're gonna focus on that portion in the red. Um, and so, so if you take phenyl, uh, fluoroglucanol and react it with aqueous hydroxylamine, you form a directly nitratable trioxine precursor and this is an easy route to form trinitrobenzene, okay? And this reaction was published about 20 years ago um, in your you know, traditional round bottom uh, flask, traditional chemistry, um, actually by one of my colleagues that also works at NOCWD. Um, so we're not doing new chemistry in, in this project, but rather we're exploring more efficient methods of doing this type of chemistry. Um, so when we apply our various accelerated techniques, um, if you look at the kind of plot in the right, uh, we saw that the paper spray uh, ionization, which again is a thin film method, provides the largest acceleration factor um, compared to um, any of the micro droplet reactors, which was our easy ESSI, uh, nano ESI, and then even more so than, than our uh, light and frost droplets. Um, now, the micro droplets and light and frost droplets all did have significant acceleration factors compared to the bulk, but for a limited time today, we're just going to focus on the thin films and the paper spray and, and some of the other work that we've done with this. So if you look at uh, on the left hand side now, A and B, we literally take our, our fluoroglucanol and our aqueous hydroxylamine, pipette it onto a piece of paper, we wait five minutes. We add on our spray solvent and we spray into the mass spectrometer. Uh, for the same five minutes, we have a round bottom flask that has our, again, same fluoroglucanol and hydroxylamine, same concentration, same you know, reaction conditions. And after the five minutes, we spot it onto the paper and spray directly in. So at a five minute um, time period, if you look at the two mass spectra uh, in between uh, in, in plot C, um, you could see that there's four peaks that are highlighted. Right now, it's the 127, uh, master charge 127, which is for the starting material of the fluoroglucanol. Uh, the peaks at 142 and 157 are intermediates, where you had one oxime formed or two oxime formed. Um, and then the final peak at 172 is the trioxime product, which is what we're looking for, which we can then directly nitrate to uh, for trinitrobenzene. Um, the other peaks in the spectra are sodiated peaks. So unless you have, you're a mass spectrometrist, you can just ignore those for now um, and really just focus on, on those other ones. Um, but you can see on the bulk spectra, there's little to no product shown at mass to charge 172. However, after the same five minutes, there's significant product formed in the thin film, which corresponds to an approximate acceleration factor, if you go back to that calculation, of about 225 times uh, faster or larger acceleration than what we're doing in traditional bulk chemistry. Now, when we started these projects, we're working on a small scale, you know, microgram to milligram scales. So these are useful for rapid screening um, or for optimizing reaction conditions. But in terms of synthetic capabilities, you know, you're not going to take this paper spray and, and start, you know, making enough material to go and do safety 
evaluation on your energetic. And that's where we then took this project was, you know, now screening, you know, on, on the, the microgram and milligram level, like I said, is kind of ideal for exploratory research, um, for new reactions, new reaction conditions, that, that scale up is really where we need to get with these acceleration factors. Uh, so we sought ways to improve our yields and two commercially available methods um, that we explored were electrospinners and rotavaps, um, both which make continuous and refresh thin films. So for the electro spinner, you continuously spray down on a rotating drum, which refreshes the thin film, um, while a rotovap similarly desalivates material because you're pulling the vacuum on it um, while rapidly spinning. So essentially, you keep recreating a thin film on your, your glass round bottom flask. Um, so you can see that in the electro spinner method, it gave about a similar acceleration factor to the paper spray uh, thin films about 209 compared to 225. Um, when we originally went to the electro spinner, we were kind of hoping that we would combine some of the micro droplet acceleration mechanism and the thin film mechanism, um, but it seems to be heavily biased towards the thin film. And we've done other work that I don't have enough time to show today that really you can go and bias it for one or the two methods. Um, but the Rotovap, uh, interestingly enough, actually accelerated an entire another order of magnitude. So if you really look at that spectrum, it's, it's much cleaner than anything that we've seen before on the paper spray or even on the electro spinner, um, that you just have a whomping 172 peak and you don't even see any of the starting material. Um, you still have some of the intermediate, but again, a, a large amount after five minutes, you, you solely have that 172 as your major uh, constituent. The... The important thing uh, when we go to the uh, uh, rotovap is now you have synthetically relevant quantities of material in the rotovap. And we went in, did some analytical characterization. So we did some NMR, carbon, proton. We did IR measurements. We did um, uh, uh, TLC. And we compared all of this to the traditional synthetic route done by the chemist who published this paper 20 years ago. So we, we contacted Jeff uh, Batara. We said, hey, can you go and make and, and follow your own method to make this trioxime? And it took him over three and three, three and a half hours to synthesize the trioxime. What we did in five minutes in the Rotovap was had the same uh, analytical purity based on the carbon, the proton, NMRs, the uh, FTIR, and the, the TLC. Um, so, so now we can make these synthetically relevant quantities in five minutes compared to that three hour, uh, especially for reactions that accelerate by thin film mechanisms. I um, mean, we're, we're still exploring some of these uh, mechanisms um, and we're also exploring additional reactions. And um, my, as I mentioned, my group is currently developing new confined volume reactors to either further accelerate our uh, accelerated conditions or scaling up these reactors so we can actually make these materials that we can then go out and do safety data testing and test out in the field. Um, so again, the, the SMART scholarship had a, a great impact on, on my career so far um, because during grad school, it really let me focus on the research. Um, and I was also able to start applying for grant funding prior to actually starting my position at the DOD. So on day one, when I started, I already had enough funding for the entire year just waiting for me and I could start running wild with my own projects. Um, another benefit of SMART is, you know, I really get to work with reactions and, and explosives um, as well as for the environmental sampling. I get to go to sites that most chemists aren't allowed to either because of clearances or again, some of the hazards. Um, as a number of the scholars today mentioned, you know, we have top tier facilities and top tier instrumentation. Um, we, we really do have a, world-class mass spectrometry facility, um, which really allows us to partner with a lot of uh, external collaborators. Um, and like I said, we were able to start the ground running and uh, forming my group. And the last thing I'll say, um, as a shameless plug, I know a lot of the participants on the call are future smart scholars, um, but my group is looking to hire five postdocs between our energetic and environmental work. So if any of you have friends or colleagues or any professors on the call that may have students graduating soon, please have them reach out to me because deadlines for postdoc applications are coming up and I am looking for five. With that, I can take any questions. Thank you.
Awesome. All right, Patrick, it looks like we have time for one question and then we'll move, roll into our very final presentation, which is pre-recorded. Um, so what effect does the synthesis technique have on the overall yield and byproduct pathways? So the, the yield right now, if we're going on those, uh, the original five that I showed, we're, we're in very, very low yields. Like again, we're, we're microgram, milligram. Uh, we can accelerate it much faster, but again, it's not something that you're going to really use synthetically. Um, on the road of app and all those, you can actually go to up to large scales and we're working on some continuous methods that we could kind of, you know, uh, like the old cartoons where you have the bread, you know, going down the, the uh, conveyor belt, um, doing stuff like that. Um, the intermediate pathways, um, we have seen sometimes where we can actually access different intermediates or bias it one way or another. Um, so again, this can also be used to do some interesting chemistry. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. Looks like there are no other questions yet for you, Patrick, but again, keep your eye on this chat. And again, if anybody has questions throughout the day, you can plot, uh, post them to the community board on Whova. Thank you so much. Again, awesome presentation. Um, great information there. And we'll move on into our uh, final presentation of today. Uh, like I said, it is pre-recorded. And let me go ahead and just pull up my notes here. All right, our final presentation is Dr. Braden Lee with the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center. And his project title is Human Enhancing Arctic Textiles or Heat. Hi everyone, thank you all for attending my lightning talk today. My name is Braden Lee. I am a recent PhD graduate from the Wilson College of Textiles at North Carolina State University where I got my doctorate in fiber and polymer science. I'm currently a phase two smart scholar at the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Today I'm gonna to be talking about human enhancing Arctic textiles or heat. Uh, this proposal or this title of the presentation was actually awarded under a smart seed grant proposal. Uh, and my situation is a bit unique because although I'm officially employed under the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center, I actually do a lot of collaborative work with the Air Force Research Lab. So to kind of understand what exactly it is I do, it's best that we understand the missions of the different groups I'm in. So the first, my official division, like I said, is the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center and it sits within the human systems division. And our goal is to acquire and support human systems to enhance warfighter performance, protection, and survivability. And our slogan is every airman, every mission, every day. So everything we touch, everything we engineer, everything we qualify goes and assists our warfighter out in the field. So we take great pride in what we do and making sure all of our airmen and warfighters have the proper equipment they need to get the job done. Within the Air Force Research Lab side, I sit within RX, which is the Materials and Manufacturing Directorate. And so this is more of the research and development arm of the Air Force. And here within RX, we seek to understand the warfighter's needs, understand the state of the art, and apply all those concepts to connect, develop, and exploit science and technology to then assist our warfighters out in the field. Within each of these divisions, I sit within different branches. So within the human systems division and the Air Force life cycle management side, I sit within combat ready airmen. And our goal is pretty similar to the overarching human systems division mission. Uh, but our mission is, is really looking at specifically to develop, acquire, field, and sustain standardized, integrated state-of-the-art equipment for all airmen. So this is airmen for ground forces and air crews. So this is pretty much the entire Air Force. Everything we touch, basically, it affects all of our air crew across the Air Force. And we want to make sure that we maximize the readiness uh, to enable a global Air Force dominance. Primarily, I work within cold weather clothing systems, uh, and cold weather handwear, headwear, clo cold weather apparel systems. And this is kind of what uh, spurred us to apply for the Smart Sea Grant proposal and really team up with the Air Force Research Lab uh, in the Soft Materials and Polymers Division, RxAS. And essentially what, what RxAS does is they plan, conduct, and direct a lot of the in-house and external research and development efforts of soft materials and devices uh, to really transition to legacy developmental and future Air Force systems and components 
And the group I work with is the liquid metal technology group out of the Air Force Research Lab. And they had developed a liquid metal ink technology uh, IP out of the labs to then push to a contractor who is now working on scalable development of these ink technologies, which we can then incorporate into textile based platforms and then use that to go assist our warfighters. So we're looking a lot at uh, uh, heating applications as well as biosensing applications. And in this slide, this kind of explains a little bit as to what I was mentioning before, some of that using that leveraging some of those ink technologies from the Air Force Research Lab. So the human enhancing Arctic textiles or heat uh, was spurred from the Smart Seed grant. And essentially our grant is looking at a collaborative acquisition and development effort towards next generation textile technologies for Arctic and austere environments. And essentially what that means is leveraging a lot of the technology and development from the Air Force Research Lab, specifically within that RxAS group I just mentioned, uh, to look at developing textile integrated sensors for haptic feedback, as well as textile responsive solutions for active heating. And we collaborate with Air Force divisions across the Air Force, as well as our external counterparts over at the Army to really develop these textile technologies that can go improve our warfighter for these very cold weather environments. And so, like I said, I'm in the life cycle management side as well as the Air Force Research Lab side. So some of the opportunities I've had working in both divisions is looking at limited user evaluations. So in these cases, what we do is we take commercial products or some of the developmental stuff out of AFRL and then actually go and field them and test them out uh, with warfighters and air crew out in the field. So this is an effort done out in Wyoming. And we were looking at evaluating commercially available heated air crew clothing and trying to understand, okay, if we have different, for example, security forces, which is the individual uh, pictured here, how does this, how does this air crew clothing interact with them? Do they like wearing the clothing? Does it meet their, does it impede their performance? Does it meet their heating standards? We, we look at all those things and then really come up with evaluation to see if we want to proceed forward with these materials, with these systems, and, and then implement them out in the field. So from this user evaluation, we saw that a lot of the heat air crew clothing systems we tested, uh, they do increase mission task ability, uh, and their overall fabric comfort is very, very good. And the heating capability is great because in Wyoming, during the January, February months, if you haven't been, it is very, very cold. The wind chill factor will probably get you down to somewhere between minus 50, minus 55 degrees Celsius. And for those of you who are on the Fahrenheit system, uh, that is very, very cold. So having these heated air crew, uh, heated textile technologies that we can then go and test them and, and feel them out to our warfighters was just which is really great and to have all the positive feedback from them to see that this stuff is actually working and can help them with their daily task is quite amazing. The one thing we did notice is that uh, some of the products now, the heating control is not quite there, as well as a lot of the electrical connections uh, makes it very difficult in terms of getting overall tasks done, which is why we teamed up with the Air Force Research Lab to go and look at using some of that liquid metal technology to then integrate it into textile platforms and use that for other applications. Like I mentioned heating, we can also use that for cabling. So a lot of those electronic cabling issues we just mentioned, this liquid metal technology can address. Uh, we really wanna focus in today on some of the work we did looking at using the liquid metal technology for electrodes. And an electrode, if you're not familiar, all it really does is it can sense uh, electrophysiological signals off the body. So you can think of things like your ECG, your heart rate, your EMG, your muscle activity, your EOG, EEG, brain waves, uh, eye activity. We can do all of that with some of this uh, textile integrated liquid metal electrode or tiles that we developed uh, with the Air Force Research Lab. So what we did was we came up with a very easy facile spray coating technique and textile integration process to create these tile or wearable dry electrodes. And what we found out was that the liquid metal can actually sense electro electrocardiogram very well, comparable to the wet electrode, which is a gold standard electrode they use in clinical settings. So great, our stuff functions 
as the state of the art functions just as good as the state of the art uh, electro technologies that are used in clinical settings. We also showed that they're durable and they're reusable. And lastly, to our knowledge, uh, we're one of the very first studies to demonstrate liquid metal biocompatibility uh, within an in situ environment. And what we showed basically was that our liquid metal technologies, as well as the tile itself, is very biocompatible with the body. And so that means we showed that it has really good sensing, it's reusable, and it is very biocompatible. So it can be used for a plethora of wearable applications. It can also be used to help our warfighters out in the field. So that's some of the work I've done as part of the proposal uh, or as part of the Smart C grant. Uh, some of the other impacts it had personally to me in regards to the overall Smart Scholarship Program as well as the C grant. I, I graduated with two degrees, got my master's in textile engineering. And like I said, I got my doctor from NC State University. Uh, been very fortunate enough to uh, co-author nine publications, a couple first authors, uh, publications in there, but primarily the big one was uh, being a first author and, and really bringing together the Life Cycle Management Center and the Air Force Research Lab to develop those textile integrated liquid metal electrodes or tiles technologies. Uh, that was really cool. And to really see the Air Force working as a whole to developing new technologies to help our warfighters, absolutely incredible. I've also been uh, accepted to give technical conference talks across the nation. I've had the opportunity to give international talks. I've been invited to give other conference talks and had the opportunity to win presentation awards. None of that would have been possible without the SMART scholarship or the SMART C grant. So for that, I'm very thankful for the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center taking a chance on me and bringing me in as a SMART scholar and for the generous funding under the SMART C grant. That is the end of my presentation. And thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. And I look forward to speaking with y'all, hopefully sometime in person when I'm actually there. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you all so very much. That concludes the first half of our day. Um, we had six awesome presentations for you. Um, there will be a very brief break. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to hop on a different link. This link will remain live and open. So you can go uh, take a quick break and come back and join us for our afternoon sessions of technical talks, which will focus on uh, test evaluation and applied engineering. So thank you all so much. And we look forward to seeing you back here at 1230 Eastern. <laughs>